Hello, everyone. I am Rick Zanotti. And I'm Harold Mugliotti. And this is Sounding Great. Today, it's all about Adobe Audition and how to edit using markers. Welcome to Sounding Great, a podcast dedicated to you. Your voice, your recordings, your audio. How you present yourself and how people perceive you. Sounding great because you can. You have a great voice and you, you just love performing or talking. You might like to get into voice acting, but you don't know where to start. I wrote an ebook series called Get Clever about voice acting and announcing to help you find your way through the maze. Get clever today. And that was from Lily Wexu. She's got a great voice too. Here we go. Uh, today we're going to talk about making our editing a little bit easier by using markers. A lot of people don't use markers or don't know how to use markers. And it can be a real pain doing it without using markers. So with markers, it allows you to segment pieces of audio from your wave, your big waveform. You take pieces of that and then you can automatically export those as individual files. So when you're doing any kind of video work, uh, primarily this is really important in e-learning and other things like that. It allows you to break things up easily and edit just what you need quickly. So I'm going to pass this on to Harold, who's going to show us how to use markers. Now, before that, let's talk about markers. There are, I believe, four different kinds of markers in Audition. One of them are, are the cue pointers or cue markers, which certain applications, like in the old days, Flash, could read and you can perform actions on those markers to either play something or show something or anything else. And they work really well, but they're not for every application, some applications. Uh, then you've got your regular markers, uh, which allow you to, to identify and you can actually put um, labels on them so that it's very easy for you to look at it later on and figure out, oh, I got to change uh, LO1, PO1, lesson one, page one, or something like that, LO1, PO1A, LO3, PO6, whatever. Uh, any of those can, can help to cut things up. Um, then what do we have, subclip markers? Well, so the second type is actually a subclip marker. Um, they don't, there's not one that's just called a just regular a marker. marker. It's, yeah. it's called subclip marker. And basically, yeah, that doesn't have the funny stuff that a cue marker might do. So you're only cutting up for subclips. Usually it doesn't matter too much what kind of marker. It could be a cue, could be a subclip. But the subclip, in just in case a certain application might do something funny with the cue marker, you use a subclip. The next type is a CD tr track marker, which pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, remember those CDs. They still make them. They're still selling them. Yeah, and the last type is called cart timer. I'm not actually sure what that does. But oh, cart timer. That's for radio. Yeah. So a cart timer is, in the old days, they had audio carts, which had all of your individual files, like your sound effect files and other things. So you could have a track which triggers some sort of cart. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, that's from the original days of sound of of audition which used to be called uh cool edit pro from centrillium that was acquired by uh i think it was adobe that acquired him and i don't think it was macromedia i think it was adobe at the time so that's where you get that from anyway harold do you want to show how we can use markers to make life easy for all you poor editors who record but maybe don't consider yourself sound engineers or even like doing this part of the voiceover world. Sure thing. Let's go over to our audition screen. So once you get in your audio from your voice talent, it's going to probably be in a long file like this where all of the uh, voice clips from your script are going to be in one um, long file and you'll have to split them up. So let's start doing that using markers. What, we, what you can do is use the time selection tool the shortcut key for that is T, which then lets you click and drag an area. And then um, when you press M, when you have an area selected, and let me zoom in on that up there, you have a marker. It's uh, enveloping that time area that you selected. What you next can do is press, press forward slash. And uh, actually, let me zoom over to the marker panel here. When you press forward slash, 
you'll be able to rename that marker. And we're going to rename it to, to correspond with our script page. So now that is renamed. We have one marker with the right name. And um, to show you how to export this, we're going to make another marker. Our second marker, I'm going to select this area. As before, I'm going to press M. That creates a marker. Let's, let's uh, zoom in over to that. You can see the marker on the timeline here. Now, now, one thing as Harold's doing this, he's not playing back the audio. Normally, you would play back the audio to make sure that you have the region you're looking for so you can hear everything, and then you would actually region this with when you hear it. We're, we're just doing this for show sake right now, but ideally, you'd be listening to everyone, and then boom, there you go. Everything in between that marker is that, re is that region that you selected, but keep in mind, that's not a clean clip. You may have to get rid of retakes and other things within that region to give you the final good clip. And that's a great point. As they say, measure twice, cut once. So let's listen to that clip here. That's where Card Buddy comes in, by helping to alleviate the problem in times of need. In this course, you'll... And, you know, the, it'll keep playing past where your time selection is, but you can watch the playhead and see where, where it gets to the end of what you've selected. So you listen to that. That sounded pretty clean, so we don't really have to cut out things, but you might have to cut out breaths and so on. If you do cut out something from the middle of this, it will actually... Actually, let me zoom in here to show you better what's going on. If I cut out, say, this tiny bit of pause here, obviously there's not much to cut, you'll notice that the end of the marker uh, shifts correspondingly, so you don't have to readjust that marker, it just does it for you, which is nice. Yeah, that's a good point, because this could be tedious. This is the part where editing is, you know, there's a little bit of a tedium to editing. You have to go through all the breaths and other things that you may not want. And uh, if the marker didn't readjust itself, the region area of the marker, you'd be cursing a lot, and we don't want that. We want you to be happy. So it's just things to consider. Now, that's only two markers that he created, so or two regions. So now, take it from there. What do you do afterwards? Well, so, um, and a another thing about renaming with the forward slash, it doesn't matter if you've done other stuff since you made that marker, it's just going to select that last marker that you um, made. So if I press forward slash, I'm going to name this to what we need it. And now that we've got multiple markers, what you can do is click the, um, you can't see my cursor there, but uh, there are, under the word markers, there are six buttons. The second from the rightmost one exports the markers that you have selected. So if I select these two, the ones we've just made, and I click that, then we'll come up with a dialog that lets us export that. And it will name the markers based, uh, it will name the files based on your marker names. Yes. There are other things you can do with the naming of the markers. It lets you add prefixes and suffixes, but I don't tend to like to use that because it doesn't give you that much freedom in the formatting. I think it always does prefix underscore next, you know, the actual marker name and then underscore suffix. I, I, I would prefer if they let you change the separation characters and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, now now you can. Now we do use prefixes a lot when we're doing big e-learning courses. Because ideally, let's say you have a 50-page uh, module and you want that all, and it starts with LO1, lesson one, page one, LO1, PO1, just as an example. You may be at the end of LO1, PO20, PO40, so you can create a quick prefix and it'll, it'll tell you now you're at LO1. And then underscore, you put in the rest, and you don't need a suffix only if you want it. And, and that will save you some time in typing, because otherwise you've got to type LO1, PO1, LO2, PO2, LO1, PO3, da, 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 da. So it'll get rid of it if you just do LO1, LO2. You, know, you can have that as, as prefixes, and that can save you a lot of time, especially on large files. And there are some, some documentar documentaries or other things that could be very large. It'll save you quite a bit of time. Um, Anything else on that, Harold? That just about shows the process. 
you you may or may you may be using single track or multi track. What we demonstrated here was single track, but it works exactly the same way in multi track. So you just have to do the same thing with the time selection tool M and forward slash, and the export button will be in the same place. And yeah. this, for the purposes of this demo, we only showed two clips. But as Rick said, you know anything that'll save you time and smooth out the workflow is very it's going to be very welcome because when you're actually doing this you're probably going to be cutting up dozens maybe even hundreds of clips yeah now internally just so so people know and, and just full transparency we use audition for all of our recording it's very good for recording we use it for editing small things however when we're editing large files we go to soundforge and that is from magix right now m a g i x Soundforge, we've been using Soundforge Pro for 20 years almost. I think it's been out about that long, maybe even longer. Um, but we've been using it since very early on. And uh, in those days, it was Sonic Foundry. Then it got acquired by Sony. Sony sold it off to Magix. Uh, so it's, it's made its way around, but it's a great tool. Uh, it's a more streamlined process for editing in, in Sony. You can, just less keystrokes. It's a little cleaner and it's got uh, a little more capabilities in the scripts that it internally creates to, to break apart, and especially with prefixes. And you can add special characters, everything else. It just has more capabilities there. However, it doesn't make it a better editor per se. They're both very good. They both edit well and they both have the same amount of great um, uh, effects and everything else. It's just that the workflow is a tad smoother in sound for just a tad. That being said, you can also create favorites in Audition to speed up some of that, where let's say you have to click make three keystrokes. Well, you can create one keystroke that does all three as a favorite. So in essence, it's like creating, it's like a macro uh, generator. It, it lets you create a macro that will take into account two, three, four steps. And that's good. So that'll save you time too. It's whatever you're comfortable with or whatever you have that you can't buy more of. We're a vendor. We tend to do a lot of developments. We have a lot of tools. We're not limited to one particular tool, and we're very tool agnostic. We like tools, period. We have our preferences, like Audition is our, our very favorite tool for recording. For voiceover, it's great. It's one of the best ones out there. When we're doing radio imaging or something like that, the multi-track is very, very easy to use. So. All of those things make Audition a great tool to use. Don't get us wrong. But we like editing, especially the long stuff we do in SoundForge because we just find it easier and quicker. Uh, your mileage may vary. Maybe you'll be faster in Audition. We're faster in SoundForge. It doesn't matter. Whatever tool you're comfortable with. Some people use Logic. Some people use Pro Tools. Um, a lot of people out there are using um, Audacity. It's not one of my favorites. Uh, it's OK. Uh, if considering it's free, you get what you pay for. It's not bad. Um, is it as good as some of the other ones? I don't think so, but it's good enough. Uh, it doesn't have all the features of an Audition or, uh, or a SoundForge, as an example, but it's got a lot. And if that's all your budget can handle, hey, have at it. It'll do for this kind of work that we're doing, like e-learning or anything else, it'll be more than good enough. But, but oh, we'll keep in mind, Audacity just got acquired. And so we don't know if it's going to rain free. I don't, no one knows yet. It'll be interesting. Um, other than that, these are all good tools. They're very good tools. And uh, very soon, we're going to have Jason Levine on, hopefully sometime in November. He is the worldwide evangelist for Adobe's um, Audition, After Effects, and uh, Premiere. He knows this stuff, and he's great. And he came from the original company, Centrillium, which made Cool Edit Pro. So he's got a lot of background with Audition and where it's going, where it came from, and everything else. He'll be a great source to talk to, and he's a great guy too. Uh, so stay tuned. That's coming in, in the very near future. Harold, any final points? That's about it. Thanks for joining us, and happy editing. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs>